Thank you to the DPC Summit Planning Committee for inviting myself and Dr. Haynes here to speak today. Um, we're going to structure this presentation. We're going to try and do half of just sort of um, our thoughts on boundaries and then the other half open Q&A. Uh, the first thing I would like to say though, so I'm Dr. Julie Gunther. I opened a DPC practice in Boise, Idaho in 2014. Um, I started going to this summit in 2013 um, and uh, am exceptionally grateful uh, that I switched to DPC. I was an employed physician and was debating leaving medicine. So you'll hear a little bit more about my story tomorrow. Um, the first thing I wanted to say though real quick is that um, one thing I've learned and probably a lot of us have learned is the path to success is not linear and it's not easy. Um, and when I think about how I define a champion, um, her name is Erica Bliss. So I don't know if she left this room. I hope she didn't. Yeah. Um, but th there's a saying that the people in the front lines take all the arrows. Uh, and one thing I've had to learn in entrepreneurship is success in entrepreneurship is fi defined very differently than in traditional doctoring. Um, that often repetitive failures are what lead to the greatest success. So because of Erica and Garrison and Q-Lions, um, we were able to pass legislation in Idaho about DPC. It was Q-Lions' data that allowed me to get, help get the bill through the Senate. Um, because of their work, the ACA has a line in it about DPC, so um, there's a lot of champions of this movement, many of them are here, um, but the work that Erica and Dr. Blisses have done in Q-Alliance is pretty phenomenal on all our behalf, so I wanted to express our gratitude. Um, now Dr. Haynes is going to introduce herself. All right, so my name is Dr. Delicia Haynes, I'm a family physician in Daytona Beach, Florida, and I started my own clinic straight out of residency. Uh, fee-for-service clinic uh, that was nine years ago and um, built my own prison and I don't know how many of you guys have have felt like you've done that yes <laughs> um, and uh, I was an interior designer before I went into medicine so it was a very well well appointed and cute clinic but it was my own prison um, and I came to the DPC summit in 2014 uh, let me back up in 2011 I was introduced to concierge medicine and um, you know, while it was, it was great, I was afraid that I would lose the diversity of my clinic if I moved everyone over to that model at that traditional price point. Um, but I had a patient who actually asked for that. And so um, by default, I kind of became this hybrid um, concierge fee-for-service practice, but it was really mainly fee-for-service because I never even marketed that part. Uh, then I, went to, I came to the, the DPC summit and it was just you know, mind blown and, and saw this as a, something that I could do, but I didn't really have a timeline for it. And the way that the universe works is you know, once you've kind of made a decision that I'm, I'm thinking about moving toward this, things happen to move you even faster in that direction. So um, that fall, the area's largest insurance company um, sent out a new contract with a new fee schedule, and it was a 40% cut. Uh, to you know what I would have been making and at the same time because everyone sells their practices the local hospitals needed billers and they poached my biller uh, so it was all these things that kind of lined up that um, mo moved me faster than I was intending to go in the direction of DPC uh, and then the other thing that was going on is I was depressed um, I was just you know you forget burnout um, I was clinically depressed uh, but I did, you know, move forward with uh, DPC, and here we are, you know, three years later, and um, doing phenomenal and making what I was making before. N the road was not straight, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we but we got there. So um, do you want this the, thing? The green button. The green, yeah. Okay. All right. So you guys can read. Um, so some of the things that we're going to talk about boundaries, because that's what we were asked to talk about, um, you know, contract structures, and really we're going to be li leaving a lot of time for questions, so go ahead and kind of get your questions together. I think that's the most valuable um, part. So boundaries are absolutely essential, especially in direct primary care, but just in life. And I love this um, because you know poor boundaries lead to resentment, anger, and bur burnout. And that's usually how I know that a boundary of mine has been crossed is because I feel resentful or I'm getting angry, uh, and that can happen in any practice model, but um, you, we do have to watch out for it in DPC. So um, it's important that, you know, there's this, you know, the idea of personal space and, you know, what's an appropriate kind of space to have between you and your patients. And 
it's different in, in relationship-based care, which is really what direct primary care is. It's, you know, it's, it really it's what care is. It's all about relationships. Um, so these are like the traditional boundary challenges in healthcare, and the interesting thing is like DPC kind of crosses all of them. Um, and this, this came from... Um, Texas AFP article on right. boundaries. So, um, so being over-familiar with your patients, patients having your cell phone number, um, after hours availability, being on first name basis, going to people's homes, their, you know, their um, life events, um, business relationships, you know, some people, is, I know that is, is Vance here, so there's a lot of people who barter, um, you know, in, in direct primary care, um, gift giving and gift accepting, and then treating, you know, your friends, your staff, your family, um, and, and that sort of thing. So um, what I think is important to remember is direct primary care fundamentally is a business model. Um, and so there, and it's a different business model, right? And that's what appeals to all of us. It's a business model where we, re we regain a lot of autonomy, where we're able to break down a lot of barriers in the physician-patient relationship to provide authentic care. Um, but there's inherent violations to sort of those Texas AFP, to what we inherently um, establish in, in primary care. And I, I personally like many of those violations because they give the patient direct access to me and I can solve problems really quickly and it reinforces that I care about people in a very personalized way. Um, but the space, that little sort of silly stick person drawing, the space between patient and physician still has to remain. Um, and, and this space needs to be clearly outlined, not just for the patient's well-being or the physician's well-being, but for your practice success. Um, my husband and I have a couple golden retrievers, and when we had our first dog, not to compare people to dogs, but um, um, we read, a, a, you know, Raising Your Puppy for Dummies or whatever book, and it said, raise your puppy to be the dog you want to live with. And that stuck with me. So when you start out and you're little, um, you can do a lot more things than when you're big. So raise your practice to be the practice you want to live in, not the prison you want to make, right? So what is this space in DPC? What are you offering? How do we define it, right? And again, people say, you've seen one DPC practice, you've seen one DPC practice. So we tried to keep this pretty broad. Um, and these are a few of sort of what we think are some of the fundamental tenets to establish boundaries. And they probably seem pretty obvious, but um, since 60% of the room is debating DPC or DPC curious, I thought we'd just start with, start, start with the simple stuff. Um, so first of all, you have a direct contract with your patient, and most of us do. Um, there's a number of contracts out there. Many of them have been legally vetted. Phil Eskew provided a contract template two years ago. Um, so you don't have to hire a really expensive lawyer to have this. Um, but the contract legally defines your services and the limits of the care you're going to provide to protect you and to set up proper expectations with your patient. Um, this is a must. I assume everybody has this and would plan to have it, but just in case it's worth saying. And I also have a welcome to the practice letter. Do you have one? Email, yeah. Email, okay. So um, I call it the rules of the roost, but it's, it's just to familiarize patients with how things work. And it's a very nuts and bolts letter. Um, and the thing I would say about the patient contract and about DPC, um, someone said at another DPC conference, no great business person markets to their least ideal customer. So think about that when you're growing your practice and you're all excited. Think about who your ideal customer is, who your ideal patient is. Most of us don't mean someone with no disease burden, um, but we might mean people who aren't hardcore borderline, right? Um, that's a tricky patient to take care of. Um, the other thing in DPC is many of you may have not had the privilege, I guess, or been allowed to terminate care with patients. Um, but if a relationship is truly non-therapeutic, you can terminate care. And there's many reasons for which a relationship is mutually non-therapeutic. Um, and that's what that door sort of symbolizes. You get to choose who you let in and you get to choose who you invite to leave. Um, practice structure. So this is an ironic lecture for me to be giving. My husband's in the audience probably laughing on the inside because I am not the structure one in our family. Um, I did not do this. And I would encourage everyone to be very, very, very mindful about this. Um, even if you have one patient, plan your day. In the beginning, you can do everything all at once. You can respond to every text, every email, see the patient. It's just sort of this scrambled egg day of everything. And your staff does the same thing, and you're meeting everyone's needs as they arise. 
Um, that structure works for some physicians, even when they get up to their full census, so to speak. It did not work for me. It became incredibly unsustainable around 300 patients. It was just this massive, disjointed frenzy of communication and dropping the ball. Um, in the beginning, if people walked in late, I would still see them. I didn't have anyone else on the schedule. Why not? It's reinforcing all kinds of bad behaviors. Um, so what's funny is you take from the system some of the structure, things about no-shows. It might sound weird to say, consider terminating people who repetitively no-show. Um, in DPC, you're not penalized if they no-show per se, right? You're still making your monthly fee. But the problem is people who consistently no-show will call the next day, they'll use a spot on your schedule, and then they'll call the next day and want in. And then if you don't meet their needs, they say, well, you say you offer same or next day visits. And you're kind of like, well, we do, but we can't keep hopping an hour or 45 minutes along our schedule, taking up time. So dysfunctional people can make your practice very dysfunctional if they're consistently that way. Um, the other thing meeting everyone's needs all at once does is you don't realize some people with pretty potent mental health problems because you meet all of their needs, so they're happy. And then when you're a little bigger and you say, you know, we've really tried to reinforce that we don't take walk-ins. It's very difficult for us to see people on a walk-in basis. If you were able to call this morning, we could have fit you in at two. They get really angry, and they've been happy for, you know, four years. So, so have a structure, have a late policy, have a no-show policy. Um, you can always make exceptions. Um, have a registration fee. I know some people are hesitant to do that. Some people say it's a barrier to entry. Establishing from the get-go that this is a relationship where you serve them and they pay you is very important for setting up the rest of your relationship. Early on, I didn't have a registration fee, and I billed in arrears. So if you bill after the fact, when we didn't have uh, legislation in Idaho, the idea is it protected me from being accused of being insurance. If you bill in advance of services provided, you look like insurance. So a number of us used to bill after the fact. Um, so I billed at the end of the month when people established, and it was due by the following month. So people had 60 days to pay me. And it set up this really wonky, like, why do I have to pay you? I haven't seen you in the last 60 days. I just saw you once. Right? Or people would get their needs met and leave. So I believe in a registration fee. Um, if people aren't willing to pay a registration fee, or they show up and say, well, I didn't know I had to pay anything, those are generally people that aren't going to be a good fit for your practice. Um, set aside time to work on your business, not in your business, because you're entering into being a physician and an entrepreneur. Um, and you have to set aside structured time to work on your business and do not violate it. Um, so, and this is um, my sample schedule. Hopefully you can see basically Monday through Friday, the gray blocks are blocked out times. So um, we're adding in aesthetics, so I do right now, I block out Monday afternoon for that. I don't see patients on Wednesdays. That's when I run the business and set up meetings with employers and people who want to learn about DPC. We have an hour lunch, it's a hard hold. I actually have a lunch break. I go outside and see the sky, it's amazing. And then, <laughs> We have windows, too. And we close at noon on Fridays. Um, so this is my personal schedule right now. Um, the other cool thing we just started, as a side note, Wednesday mornings we open an hour later, and I do educational talks with staff about the aging face, management of hypertension, and it's been really great to scale up some of the staff's medical knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would, this is my ideal day on the left. I would encourage you to have a daily workflow. Um, um, someone said the fastest way to kill a nurse is to wait till the end of your day or nighttime, do all your stuff, so every day she or he shows up and their inbox is full, right? So I would encourage, no matter what setting you're in, to have a workflow where you show up before they do, get through as much of the messages, labs, etc., as you can. Um, and in DPC, it's really hard not to just do everything as it comes, but it will blow up in your face down the road. Um, so Dr. Haynes is going to take over. Yeah. And really, I mean, structure is your friend. Uh, so the same as, as, as Julie, I have a calendar for my day, and, it, and just as importantly, I have a calendar for the activities that I want to do after work and things that I want to get to. Um, because if it's not in your calendar, we're busy people. It just doesn't happen. Like, you know, the, the times that you're going to really focus on the, uh, the finances of the practice, the actual business of a practice, you do need to make a profit or you will not be in business very long. Uh, so, you know, setting aside the time that you're going to look at, okay, who's not paying us? Um, <laughs> and what are we doing about it? You know, are we sending out letters? Are we, are, we, are we talking to them? Are we seeing what's going on in their life? 
Um, I think all of us, you know, work with people who work with us in terms of patients who aren't able to make their financial obligations. And then, you know, there are those other patients who go into like, you know, witness protection or whatever when you start calling <laughs> them um, about, their, about their membership. But uh, Pareto's principle, you know, the 80-20 rule, and um, it's interesting because in whatever practice, whether it's DPC or fee-for-service, 20% uh, of your patients are 80% of your headaches. Uh, and that's definitely true in DPC as well. And so I, th I think always being in, in action of what are you doing to manage the things that frustrate you. So I keep a little index card of like what happened that week that pissed me off. And at the end of the week, part of that's on my calendar is, okay, so what am I doing so that I don't have as many of the things on that index card? Um, you know, how am I changing it? What boundaries am I putting in place? Because usually it's a, it's a boundary, it's an expectation thing. In any relationship, they have, you have an expectation of what the, the services you're gonna provide. They have an expectation. And if there's a mismatch in that expectation, that's really when conflict, you know, occurs. Um, so making sure that from the beginning you're setting up your expect that you're you're setting the right expectation with your patients, and that you're um, reinforcing that not just in writing but you know verbally you know however however they communicate best. Um, everyone signs my contract. I'm convinced that not everyone has read it, and um, and and actually you know some people that come in they're sick so they're not reading you know they they just want to get better so they're just kind of like signing off on things. So um, telling them again, like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm available to you. These are the, this is the mode of communication, or you know, this is, this is, this is how this relationship is going to work out. Because your patients really do want to be good patients, but you have to tell them how that happens. Um, so be, be really clear at that. And we're not here because we're experts at boundaries. It's because we don't suck as much as we used to. <laughs> and so, <laughs> That's perfect. Right. That's perfect. Right. We're, we've, it's very we've, true. Made, we've made you know, <laughs> leaps and bounds and, and can share with you some of our mistakes. So some of the themes that come up when we talk about boundaries, especially in DPC, you know, the do I have to pay when I don't come in? Like, do I have to pay every month even though I didn't come in? Yeah, yes, it's a membership. It's in the contract um, or the agreement. Um, and so, you know, some people... Direct primary care is like the, the easiest model that's really hard for some people to understand. Uh, so you may have to explain it a few times. Um, and you know, we actually, we created a video because we recognized that people weren't reading so that they could further understand what they were signing up for. And you know, some people just don't really get it, even though it, it may be really simple you know, to us. Um, but yes, you, you have to pay, and, that, and if you don't pay, you are no longer a member. The, the services are for members. Um, so your expectation of you know, getting your refills and getting you know, care if you're not a paying member uh, is a falsehood. You know, this is, we have to get paid, otherwise you will not be in practice. Um, and I guess one thing yeah. I would comment on that, uh, try really hard not to take things personally. Mm -hmm. It's a very personal relationship. Um, business people, I guess, know this. I, like, I, and most of my patients are amazing. But like, I've had people straight up lie. Like, oh, I know I owe you money. I'm sick today. Like, I know I'm behind three months. Can you help me? Yes, I'll help you. OK, I'm going to go to the ATM. I'll be right back. <laughs> and witness protection program. And so it's kind of like naive of me to be like, you just straight up lied. Like, like lied, and even then I continued to take care of this person for a while because I was a very slow learner. So um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a transactional agreement, right? And um, most people are grown-ups about it. A small number aren't. And the sooner, my husband says all the time, fail fast. Mm -hmm. So the sooner you catch on to the folks who are going to, uh, for, for which you're not going to have a mutually beneficial relationship. They're not going to sustain your practice or your joy for DPC. Um, the sooner you catch on to that and these, these sort of boundary violations, uh, the better off you'll be. Yeah. Fail fast and fail forward. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't fail back. <laughs> there is no failing back. You, if you learn from it, you just move on. Um, and the, you know, the, the I'm paying so much, so I'm going to utilize you for everything. <laughs> um, I've got to get my money's worth, you know, uh, patient. 
Um, so, you know, you will attract some patients who are going to be overutilizers, um, especially, you know, especially early on. And interestingly, my experience with this has been that early on those people will use your services pretty routinely, and then there comes a point where they realize that you're there, and then they chill out. Um, now that's actually what we were taught in medical school is how you work with those patients is that you always have them on the schedule, but in reality, you just can't do that. And in indirect primary care, you know, you, you can. Uh, so my experience has been that while I will have a couple of those patients that will come in that I know their name is going to be on the schedule like every week for like a month, and then they really like disappear. Um, and to the point that one time that I got a little bit anxious because I was like, I haven't seen so-and-so. And so I called her, and she was like, I'm in Germany. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I guess I'll calm down, you know, since, you, since you're obviously fine. Um, so, but, you know, but, and it's okay to tell someone if they, if they're, um, if you feel like they're overutilizing, like, this is not appropriate. Uh, and that's perfectly great to say. Uh, the just real quick patient, um, so even though you have 30 minutes to an hour with each patient, it, you can really easily spend that time like, you know, catching up on softball and sports and, you know, all that, and then the same thing happens, your hand's on the door, and they're like, oh yeah, so I've been having some chest pain. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really dizzy lately. Especially when I was at the game. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and, um, and also, you know, people, because so much of the care can happen outside of the exam room, people will just see you on the street and they'll just, hey, I just, real quick, you know, I got this, <laughs> this rash right here. Um, and um, a lot of direct primary care patients feel like they are your only patient because they do get such a high level of care. Um, so just, you know, be really, be really wary of enabling people. I'm all about empowering people and not enabling them. Um, I'm no one's mother yet. Uh, so I tell people like, yeah, I'm not your mom. Uh, so, um, um, but you know, really, you know, empower your patients. I, I was loving what Erica said and, and you were a huge inspiration to me in the, in the conference. Um, because I think we come and sometimes we look for people who, who remind ourselves of ourselves. Uh, so I was looking for someone who looked like me or someone who had a similar experience to me. Um, in 2014, you know, I went and talked to you afterwards and, you know, got a lot of my questions answered. And so um, you, you got a lot of just amazing people in the room. Um, let's see, here we go. Oh, that you didn't tell oh, me. Oh, that you didn't tell me. <laughs> um, especially, you know, so you're, for those of you who are treating, who, um, you know, treat a lot of pain patients, like that's an area that you have to have like steel clad agreements in and, and especially because in certain states they're really coming after doctors. Um, you wanna make sure that you, know, you are um, just really clear about what the agreements are and that they're in line with that. Yeah, and if you think the narcotic issue, think about this from a, I don't know, non-physician perspective, right? So an entanglement I've got myself in is so this patient doesn't pay you, they no-show frequently, and you're dispensing narcotics to them? Well, they have chronic pain, and in Idaho we don't have gap coverage, and he has no money, and he's living out of his truck, and he, like, but what doctor takes care of people for free, right? So you can, you can kind of forget, um, my nurse says no good deed goes unpunished, which I argue with her on, um, but DPC can set up the opportunity to really do some creative things. Um, but just make sure you maintain enough structure to protect your license. So you, you know, we're already sort of fringy a little bit in our practice model. Um, and so really when you're thinking about, you know, doing, doing things that are a little untraditional, just you still have to protect yourself, I guess. And your kindness can, can put you in a business conundrum that looks really weird from the outside. Um, and we talked about borderlines a little bit. Uh, Dr. Haynes had said to me that um, uh, what people are paying for is peace of mind. They're paying for cost transparent care, high quality cost transparent care. I would argue they're not paying for a piece of your flesh. And so when you're new and you're super excited, super excited about it, you can really oversell mm -hmm. and you don't have to do that. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and, and the whole, um, was the, the, the saying, um, under promise, over deliver? Right. That's right, okay. Um, over promise, under deliver. No, that's backwards. Right. <laughs> Like, hold on. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but in DPC, that's what we tend to do sometimes. Like, I'm going to be your best friend 24-7. You can call me anytime. No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm your doctor. Um, and, you know, if you need me, I'm here for you. Uh, but, um, you know, these are certain things that can be taken care of, you know, hours in, within office hours. Like, don't call me after hours for refills um, because we have office hours for that. Uh, and so, you know, just setting, just again, setting that, setting that expectation, we are constantly treating people or teaching people how to treat us in every situation. Uh, so, and that's what I always like remind myself, because there's a lot of things that I could do. Um, you know, I could, you know, never leave my office and, or, you know, always take care, just be there 24 seven, just looking at my phone, waiting for somebody <laughs> to send me a little, you know, to, to need me. Um, but, you know, I, I want to have a, a life, and I want my patients to see me having a life. Like, I've been a hypocrite for so long in my previous practice talking about lifestyle medicine, you should sleep eight hours, and you should do this, and I wasn't doing any of that. Um, and so now I'm able to um, live the lifestyle that I was recommending for my patients, you know, so I'm sleeping. Um, I, before my car accident, I was rowing with the Halifax Rowing Association. I was out there on the water getting it done <laughs> and just flowing and um, didn't have my phone with me. And I, had to, I did have one patient who um, gave me like a waterproof carrier so I could keep <laughs> my phone with me. And I was like, thank you so much. I can take pictures now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, just constantly, you know, and, and people, you know, it's, it's great to be a role model for, you know, for your patients. And that was something that I'd always wanted to be, do and, and didn't have time to do. Um, we do a lot in the community. Uh, so um, one of my mentors said, don't, don't confuse your business with, with your charity. And that was like you know, a huge thing for us because you know, I, if you looked at my personal statement from like medical school or pre-med, it probably said taking care of indigent people and um, well, it did say that actually. Uh, so, <laughs> and then when I got when I when I was older, I was like, oh, but they can't pay you, and that makes it really hard to pay back those loans, and they're not just going to forgive you know those. So, um, because my practice is doing well, I can do a lot more in the community. We we started a blood pressure initiative. We had a patient that came in with this beautiful haircut blood pressure in the stroke range. And I was like, I know whose chair he's sitting in every two weeks or every week. Uh, so I went to the barbers with a bunch of blood pressure cuffs and hey, can I, can I show you guys how to screen for blood pressure here? Because they're not gonna darken my doorstep, but they're gonna come to yours. Um, and they did a huge article about that. They never, my, my, they've never done an article on DPC in my, in my town, even though I'm the first direct primary care practice in Volusia County. But they do articles about like all the other things that we do. <laughs> But I've been able to do that stuff because of direct primary, because of changing my business model. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, the after hours communicator. Uh, so, you know, texting is just extremely easy. You know, people think about you and they'll just kind of shoot off a text. And, you know, you see it and you just want to, like, deal with it right then and be done with it. But you're reinforcing maybe a, a habit that you don't want to reinforce. Just don't do it. Um, yeah. I think I think texting sounds so awesome, and it potentially could be really awesome. We had offer we had texting for the first two and a half or three years we were open. Last June, I got rid of texting. No one complained. Mm -hmm. um, I found a fundamental problem was, um, and I know a lot of people like texting. They think it's great. Josh Umber and I had a conversation. He argued this is just going to increase your phone volume, and he may be right. We have a pretty high phone call volume. Um, what I found is I was texting after hours if I was working late. Oh, your pap's normal, your labs are great, have a great weekend. So I was reinforcing this sort of I'm available to you all the time. And there was a huge chunk of patients that could not understand that it actually came to me. So um, my last text was in the, on Mother's Day. Hey, Dr. G, happy Mother's Day. Can I come in for those labs I was supposed to get done three months ago? And I was like, I am done. Um, because you have the choice to either train your patients, which for me means argue with them by text every time, or now all of a sudden the intellectual burden of remembering to do a task is mine, and I was dropping the ball on some things. 
um, because I'd get the text and think I'm gonna handle this on Monday and then I wouldn't. So, so you know, there's a whole bunch of different views in DPC. I got rid of texting and um, haven't regretted it. Patients, I figure if, if our patients call the practice and hit number nine if it rings through to me, I now let it, it says this is Dr. Julie Gunther's personal cell phone. Um, I get about 10 calls a month and I get one message because it's just enough layers that people realize like, oh, I'm calling her. Um, and so I've set up a few, a few things where I'm still available, but really trying to help people understand, like, if you really need me, I'm here, but let's make sure you really need me. Yeah, and, and there, you know, telemedicine in, in general has some shortfalls in that there are certain patients that it's just not good for, and not everybody's a good historian. Uh, so, you know, they'll send you a text message, and then if you talk to them, you're like, wait, but, you know, are you short of breath? <laughs> you know, and that's not what they texted about. Uh, so... I've never, I don't enjoy text in general, like the getting into like this back and forth, like texting thing. I just don't like it, so I don't encourage it. Um, my patients know that they can call. Um, they can email, um, and they can do like the whole patient portal thing. Um, but I, I really, I personally don't like text. And that, and that's, you know, where you have, you can do whatever you, you can do what you want in direct primary care. Like, you know, how do you want to communicate with your patients? How do you want to encourage them to communicate with you? Make sure it's in a way that you actually want to receive, um, which sounds like common sense, but sometimes it's common things aren't common. Um, the patient that no one can help, you know, there's always that, like, no other doctor can help me, and, you know, and, and, um, that's always, you know, a, a red flag. Like, if truly no other doctor in the history of doctordom <laughs> has been able to help you, <laughs> it's just, it's, 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 it might be unlikely that I'm going to help you. Um, and, you know, there are certain people that they're, that they, one, may not really be looking for help. And then there's a lot of the personality disorders. Right. Um, and really... Um, getting good at kind of like realizing when it's, when, it, it's, when it's a personality disorder that you're really kind of dealing with versus, uh, you know, a problem. A lot of people need therapy. Um, I think everyone should be in therapy personally, I, yeah, me, me but um, I didn't realize how, I've always sort of been known for being a patient advocate and spending a lot of time with patients. Um, in the last four years, I realized, so therapy sessions in my community cost $150 an hour. I cost about $2 a day. So I was doing hours upon hours upon hours of therapy. Now, if you love that and you're passionate about it, I would still argue at most standard DPC rates, you have no business doing copious amounts of therapy because it's not sustainable. Um, so be, just be mindful when you start out again and you're super enthusiastic and you are able to help people because you have more time and they feel heard and you're going through the records and you're connecting all the dots. Be mindful about how, when you transition to being a therapist because, because your practice is going to be more sustainable if you set up a standard of, you know, okay, we've done one counseling session with me, but let's get you to a counselor. Um, the other thing, my strong recommendation, if you take any pearl from this talk at all, it's, you know, you got to hustle in the beginning, but people who call and want in the same day never stay around. So the, I want in, I need a visit, I need it today, yeah, I'm joining, this is awesome. Those are not ideal patients. Um, and then um, the patients who love you tell their friends and family. Mm -hmm. So if you build a practice on people who don't pay their bills, they refer their friends who don't pay their bills. I've made that mistake, like one of my biggest referral sources, nobody pays their bills. Um, so, so just be thoughtful too, you know, think, think ahead, raise, raise your practice to be the practice you wanna live with. And, and I absolutely, I love that. And, it, and it's, it's hard in the beginning because you just kind of like need, you're like, I just need some income. So if you have a pulse in a wallet, I'll take care of you. Um, <laughs> But, um, but, but really, you know, in, in the beginning, you've got time to do a lot of, of things that when you have more patients, you might not have the time to do. So when you're small, be thinking about, uh, you know, again, that expectation setting, like I don't, if, you know, how long is it going to take for them to, for me to get back to them? If they get used to like a, you know, a one hour turnaround, then that's going to be the expectation going forward, regardless of what size you are, because you've created that expectation. Uh, so being really mindful of those things, you know, when you're starting so that you are sustainable uh, because there's things that you can do with two people that you can't do with 400. 
um, or that you'll go crazy if you try to. So um, a great quote from Brene Brown, and if you haven't watched her YouTube videos, she's got some really great mm -hmm. videos, but, um, or TED Talks. Daring to set boundaries is about having the courage to love ourselves even when we risk disappointing others. And I think for family doctors, that part right there, we're afraid of disappointing people, we're afraid of letting people down. Um, we can do amazing things with the health system, but we can't carry the whole thing on our backs by ourselves. So um, yeah, I think that's the last slide. So we'll take questions. I don't know, Bethany's bringing up. Hit us with hard ones. We'll like act it out. Good guy, bad guy. No, I'm teasing. Um. Decrease it. So question is, do we charge for after hours phone calls a modest fee? I do not. Do you? I don't. No. Um, and I don't really get after hours phone calls. Um, when you kind of take care of things within the, you know, the, the time, when you wrap people up real tight, and in DPC you have time to do that, and, and, and teach them like, okay, if this happens, you do this. If this happens, you do this. Um, so it cuts down on the need for that after hours communication. Um, if it's really an emergency, they're going to the emergency room. Like, call me yeah. afterwards. I've said, well, the most helpful thing I've said, and it took a while to craft this, is I tell everyone, I say, if you are really sure you need to go to the urgent care, I want you to call me first. Mm -hmm. But if you can't stand up or something's actively bleeding, you go to the ER. Um, and I actually had a patient fall on the ice, unresponsive. Her daughter called us first. <laughs> and it's the only time in seven years working with my nurse that I heard my didn't even triage. She's like, you call 911 right now. And she actually had a head bleed. Um, I had a portal message that was like, when I eat this, my throat feels really tight and I get wheezy and I can't breathe. I saw it three days later and I called the patient right away and said, never, ever, ever do that mm -hmm. again. <laughs> you either call me or you go straight to the ER. So every once in a while stuff, stuff comes through. But um, as Dr. Haynes said, as I've set some firmer boundaries, I, don't, I know everyone worries about like, oh my gosh, you're gonna be inundated with phone calls. You just aren't. Um, it, it's very, very sustainable. So. The question, the first one in the top is, how do you handle open refills? For example, I give six to 12 months supply when labs are up to date, but when they are no longer members, is it okay to have ongoing refills? So this is tricky. So do you dispense? So I don't. Okay. Um, so we have an in-house pharmacy, yeah. and one of the benefits is like a year of lisinopril is like $4, mm -hmm. right? So if the labs are good and people have been on a medicine forever, um, what I usually do is I'll give people 90 days to start out with, which is a little bit arbitrary, 90 days. And then the people who, who, are, who I know I'm gonna be able to supervise for a long time, I'll give people up to a year of meds right then and there. Have I been burned? Have people then like quit the practice after they got these greatly discounted medicines? Yeah, but the medicines aren't the source of profitability. And if they, if they are happier elsewhere, I'd rather they go elsewhere. Um, Was that asking like if they're not paying you? Yeah, the idea is, do you give a, do you give a refills? Um, what I also do as a if policy... they're not paying me, I don't give what, <laughs> what I do as a policy is, <laughs> if a patient terminates care, I'm not going to be a member anymore, and then they call the next week, oh, I need refills, which happens, because people forget. We'll call um, 90 days into the pharmacy, at, not on controls or anything like that, but on you know, blood pressure. We'll call 90 days into the pharmacy and say, please try to find another physician, because we're not going to refill these anymore. Right, so and if, if we've got people who were discharging from the practice and you have to take care of them for 30 days anyway, um, and you know, we'll give them 30 day supply of their medications and that sort of thing. Um, but I, one of the things that early on I had to get really firm with was um, you know, if, if someone is not paying me, what is our relationship now? Right. Uh, and, um, and I wasn't even, in the beginning, I wasn't always paying attention to who wasn't paying. Um, I didn't have a system in the beginning where I was like, you know, taking time to work on the business and looking and looking at that. And, and really, it was a very small number of people, but they were the source of like so many headaches. Um, so they were on that like that pissed off list of things that I had to like make a change about. And that was one of the changes that we made was we actually started, you know, calling like we, we call people every month. Like as soon as like if you know you, you haven't you know, paid your membership, we're calling to say, okay, what's going on in your life? You know, we're gonna work with you if you need us to work with you, but um, people think that we're rich because we're doctors and that, that uh, we don't need the money. 
And if you don't, if you're not like reminding them that no, for real, we do. Um, <laughs> then it's easy for them to to just kind of like you know keep bumping around, and, and especially they know that they know we're compassionate. Like you guys are in here on a Saturday, you're compassionate people. Um, so they're gonna kind of like pull in the heartstrings and everything. So I, I, I was putting myself in a situation where I felt like, well, I have to send the, the medication in, and it just became a lot easier when I started like being more firm about, okay, like we're gonna discharge you from the practice, um, we're gonna take care of you for this long, you know, here are the medications for you know this time period, um, but you know, if you if you if you set a rule, you have to like also be willing to enforce it. Otherwise, it's not a real boundary. Yeah, and that gets to um, a, a good bullet or learning point, which is um, at one point we had $17,000 in uncollected f monthly fees. Um, and that was a business transition point where I was doing the books, but growing the practice and seeing too many patients, and I had some of my own health issues. So um, it, cre it gets really hairy if you I would say you let patients get behind on their payments. So right out of the gates, whether it's like the last Friday of the month or every Friday afternoon, go through your books. Do not let people get more than a month behind because what happens is they'll be three months behind and fall and hurt themselves and call you and you'll log into your EMR and see, oh, they've got a balance, a huge balance. They haven't been paying and they'll be like, I need you to come in and see me today because I hurt my knee four days ago and it's Saturday. And it creates a really wonky structure, right? You haven't formally terminated the relationship, you haven't brought up with them, hey, your credit card's failing. So stay on top of, of your payments and it will prevent a lot of boundary issues. Um, so the question that's highest, first patient visit, do you only talk about the practice and boundaries and take a general history or do you also address medical concerns? Um, we have two options, people, and we don't do this one as much anymore, but early on we'd let people come in and learn about the practice, and we'd schedule a half hour for that, but what we learned we had to say is, this is just to find out if you like us, if you like Dr. Gunther, this is just to talk about the practice, she's not going to do any health care, because within two seconds of walking in my building, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to join, and we've booked 30 minutes, and I think I'm not doing a visit. Um, so we, if people just want information, we tell them um, we, we would schedule visits just for learning about the practice and then say we can get you back the following week or even the next day to do an established visit. Um, yeah, and, and <clears throat> early on we did the complimentary meet and greets where you could come in and um, they you know, get a tour of the practice, and, um, which was done by my medical assistant, who was a medical assistant student, so I didn't have to pay her. <laughs> um, which, no, because they need like so many hours, you know, for their certificate. Um, and so, I, I mean, I hired her and then I started paying her. But, um, but um, you know, she would walk them around and everyone felt very loved. And then I would just like kind of like come in for a hot second and, you know, say, hey, I'm Dr. Haynes. Nice to meet you. Did she, you know, answer all your questions? And the... And the expectation was always set up from the beginning that this is not a medical visit. Like, I'm not here to talk about specifics of your disease. This is to, you know, really, it's like, do you like me? Do you trust me? Um, and do you, you know, do you feel comfortable moving forward? Um, and that's also been a great time where you find out people that you're like, yeah, this is not going to be a good fit. Um, and so there's some people that I've been able to, you know, to say like, I, I don't think this is, I don't, I'm not the doctor for you um, in those situations. Yeah. Um, what if a patient does not want to pay with a debit card or credit card and they want to use cash? Has this been an issue? Um, no. We take cash. You go to Office Depot, buy one of those little cash books so you can give them a receipt and keep track of your cash drawer. Um, I have staff that I would let raise my children right now because we're so small. But I, I think as you scale, you have to be really mindful about your cash flow, right? It's an easy thing for people to take. Mm -hmm. But um, no, we let people pay almost every way. Yeah, we try not to form barriers against people paying us, um, but it's easier if it's through credit card or through ACH draw. Uh, so that's what we encourage, but we do accept other forms of payment, but it's, it's just harder to keep up with compared to, um, I use Hint, so you know, it's just harder to keep up with compared to like that system where you know, it's like auto, auto doing it. Yeah. Um. Do you have a one-time visit fee as well as a membership? Ooh. Say $50 a month fee or a $100 one-day fee. Do you want to take that? 
Oh, so <laughs> we did in the beginning because we were hungry. Nothing that we do is a one-time visit. People come in, they're like, well, my blood pressure is 150 over 90. It has been forever. I'm lightheaded, so I just need to see you once. So um, we did, and I, I guess, you know, money is money, and you need to hustle when you're starting out. And it's a great service, but to a certain extent, it compromises your business model. I guess if I had to do it again, I would do it. I did $100 for a one-time visit, and I told people it's 30 minutes. Um, and what happened then is the next month, that patient would say, oh, I need this or that, and, and where are we? So think ahead, how are you going to handle this? Because um, many patients, even if they're intellectually sophisticated, don't understand primary care. They just don't. They don't understand family medicine. So um, think ahead. But we did, and, and, um, and I don't regret it, but we got to a point where we stopped doing that. The other argument is one-time visits for patient members, loved ones who are back home from college or traveling. Um, we did that as well. And then we had a family um, visit for like four months, and there were seven of them. And so that was a new boundary setting opportunity as well. Because um, we, did, we did free care for a visiting family member, right? But we didn't specify like seven people with four adults visiting forever. Um, um, yeah. Um, how do you sustain yourself financially initially? Um, so I had, because I was transitioning my, um, my established practice, and I did kind of like this weird two-step transition. I, I mentioned that I was depressed when I was doing this. Um, not the best decisions were made. Um, so I sent out a letter where I transitioned my commercial patients on one day, and then I gave myself a year, and then I transitioned my Medicare patients. Really, it created a lot of confusion. Um, but, I mean, I'm still here, so, I mean, it worked, but, um, <laughs> but I, I could, it's, it's, it was definitely a lot easier if I had just, like, just, you know, just jumped, but I've never been that person that jumps into cold water. Um, I made sure I had set up some other avenues that, where I could work, like, be it urgent care or doing some other things. I ended up not needing them. I, I made sure that I, I had access to a loan, um, I didn't need any of that, but I would have been so much more anxious if I didn't have that, like, you know, that knowing that I, that I have some other options for income. Um, so I think just getting your financial house in order, um, I decreased a lot of overhead personally. Uh, so I'm, I'm single head of household. Every bill has my name on it. Uh, so, you know, I just made sure that I was being really mindful about um, what I was spending and um, what other avenues for income I could have. Yeah, so we sold our house, sold our cars. My husband works full time. He's not a physician. Um, and I worked four jobs for the first two years of startup. I was a, um, well, and I got a pretty big bonus um, because I was paid a third of what a male colleague I shared a job with. We were both hospice medical directors, and it flushed out that they had accidentally screwed up our contracts. And so for three years, I made a third of the pay he did. Um, so I got some back pay for that right before I opened. Not as much as I should have. I asked for back pay to when I figured out the discrepancy. I should have asked for back pay to the time I started working. Mm -hmm. um, but I worked um, Fridays and Saturdays at an on-site urgent care. I was hospice medical director 10 hours a week. I did insurance physicals, and then I had Spark. Um, and then I got breast cancer and had to quit all that. Oh, I was flying to Montana to do locum tenens work too, and I'd done my first shift, and then I was diagnosed with breast cancer. That was like year two and a half. Um, so I would encourage everyone, everyone today needs to log in and buy a disability policy. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, have a long-term disability policy. End stop, no question, get it now, because when you need it, you can't buy it, right? So. Um, but so we had, you know, I had, we did all of our numbers and I had to contribute $17,000 a year to our home budget um, to be able for us to stay afloat. Um, and, and we did that by decreasing our mortgage by $1,000 a month and selling our house and stuff. I chose to buy a building right out of the gate, so I also got an SBA loan and a practice finance loan from Wells Fargo, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, it created and has continues to create a much slower, transition to profitability, but since day one, I've been putting 
um, basically $4,000 a month into a building that I bought for $450,000 and it was just valued at $900,000. Um, it's in the shadow of the hospital and sort of screws up their footprint. Um, so, you know, <laughs> if they want it for $3 million, it's for sale. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so, do either of you allow patients to schedule appointments themselves? Advice on boundaries around this. I do. So, well, we have the um, pa patients can put themselves on my schedule, kind of like electronically. Uh, so, you know, I I've set the, like, the time block, uh, but patients are able to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I the. Um, so I'm on Alation as an EMR, and I use Atlas to run my practice. Um, I, if, I would love it if patients could just schedule their own visits. I would love it. Um, and, and there's some ways to do that. So Alation, wherever you are, please set that up. Um, uh, do you have any personal friends who have wanted to become patients? If so, what did you do? I do have patient, um, personal friends who are patients. Um, and Friend, and patients who have become friends. Um, and, I, and really it's, you know, like you, you, you just have to transition that relationship. So like we go out for drinks and that's um, friend time. And something may come up that I'm like, okay, do you need me to transition into like service mode? Because now is really not the time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I can be better for you if, you know, if we do this at another time. Um, so, um, and, and my doctor is my best friend, actually, um, who has become my best friend. Um, it's, you know, it sets up, it, you know, it, it's, it's hard in those emergent situations when you want to, like, maintain that objectivity and you're so invested and you're, you're so, you know, you're so close. Um, so I think that's like the hard part, more so with family, um, but sometimes the friends are the family that you choose. Uh, so, um, but just even even in that relationship, or especially in that relationship, you know, that line of like, okay, like I'm in doctor mode right now, and this is what we're saying. Now in friend mode, we might do something else, but you know, my recommendation from doctor mode is this. Um, so just really having those really strong boundaries. I have a few. My general rule is if I can't fire you, I won't be your doctor. Um, so if I can't fire you as a friend, I won't be your doctor. If I can't fire you, as, or if I have to fire you. Um, I have an esthetician that just started. She's actually been my patient for the last eight years. And our, when we sat down and talked about our arrangement, I originally agreed, yeah, I'll still be your doctor. And then I, I just said, no, there's too many relationships there. So referred her to someone else. Um, I take care of a lot of the neighborhood kids at times. Um, and the parents like insist on paying me for it and I wish they'd just let me deal with their boo-boos and stuff on the side. Um, and then I take care of a couple physicians who were mentors to me and that was, we just had a real frank heart to heart about what does this look like? And it's hard when doctors need doctors but they're your doctor friends, right? Um, so I think if you can't keep the relationship separate or for me at least, if I have one relationship with someone where I could need to fire them or remove them from my life, I won't, I won't be their doctor. Um, or if I feel like I can't remain objective. Um, so, um, if a patient is in arrears in payment, do you still need to give 30 days to terminate the doctor-patient relationship, for example, prescription refills? Um, I do. Uh, you can look up your malpractice. Uh, I'm with MIEC. Most malpractice companies have a really great discussion about termination, proper termination of patients. Um, some doctors send patients to collections. I don't, it's not worth it. It's not worth the hassle to me. Um, uh, I think, but the interesting thing about termination, a lot of physicians are afraid of termination. One area where it seems like everyone agrees, and if Phil's here, he, raise your hand if I'm wrong. Okay, Phil, thank you. Um, so where everyone seems to agree is when, when I talk to my malpractice company, I say, well, they haven't paid me. Everyone's like, oh yeah, no, like if they don't pay you, so, you know, we worry about things, but, but failure to pay for services rendered is, is a totally legit reason to terminate a patient. So it's like the most legit reason. Um, Phil is nodding, so I got it right. Um, but we, you know, we worry a whole bunch, but like if they threaten you or your staff or they're mean, like just downright oh, mean, yeah. or you, if they don't do anything you say, I mean... I don't generally t terminate people who don't do what I say. I just anticipate no one will ever do what I say. Um, and, but, but, but 
the non-therapeutic relationship can mean like, it's not mentally or physically healthy for me to take care of you, or maybe we're the wrong fit because I'm too nice. I have a few patients that have gotten tons better since I added my nurse practitioner, and they're like, well, I don't like how she talked to me about the cardiologist, but I'll go. And I'm like, I have been telling you for three years. <laughs> and they're like, well, you didn't put it that way. So sometimes I think you're not getting better because I make this too comfortable. So, um, yeah, all right, one more. So vote it up, whatever you want. Um, all right, here's the one I'll give it to you. How do you accommodate everyone for same day or next day appointments as needed? You don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, and um, same or next day appointments is not always a face-to-face -face appointment. Uh, so it could be a virtual visit. Um, you want to be mindful of what you're promising to people. Uh, so um, because if you're telling them, you know, if you're setting that expectation, then that's obviously what they're going to expect. So, um, you know, a visit can happen in a lot of different, in different ways. Yeah, the kiss of death in DPC is having a totally full schedule, in my opinion. Because if you, the physician, answer the phone, so uh, we had a Tuesday where I didn't have anyone on the schedule, my nurse practitioner was full that day, and I answered the phone, and I think I answered 10 phone calls. Six of the 10, the first thing the patient said is, I'm just, oh my gosh, you know, oh my gosh, answer your own phones now? Um, which, yeah, okay, what do you need? Um, <laughs> and they, um, yeah, I have hands and an ear. Um, but, um, but no, once we got over that hump, the first thing was, well, I just need to schedule a visit. And I said, okay, that's great. Um, what, what, do you wanna, what do you wanna do in your visit? And then people, well, I might, I've got this toenail, and then, oh, well, what's happening? And we get through, oh, well, maybe I don't need to come in. I mean, if you could just refill my hydrochlorothiazide, yeah. So six of the 10 phone calls, the patient kind of talked themselves out of the need for a visit because I was available to answer questions. So you'll hear about doctors who have a no-hitter or no one on the schedule. There's a lot of communication happening and we're not quantifying care by emails and phone calls in DPC and, and hopefully someday we will. But honestly, it's this incredibly slippery slope. The more you're in the room, the less you're able to be available on the phone and then the more people want to come in. But you can handle so much on the phone. Um, we're at 620 patients and we don't get, we get complaints when people only want to see me because um, we're working on that as a transition, but I wouldn't say in general we don't not meet people's needs. So thank you guys. All right. All right.